So welcome, uh, Peter Beer. We're here at uh, uh, the ThingsCon conference in, in Amsterdam. Uh, you already mentioned to me before this uh, interview that it's a, it's a large conference. It's just part of a larger network, and you all started this. Yeah, I was one of four co-founders who started ThingsCon like three years ago now. First as an event only in Berlin, then also in Amsterdam. And in 2016, we opened it up to the whole community to host local events. And so in 2016, we had like 20 or a little over 20 events uh, all across Europe. The first one in Asia, first one in South America. And in 2017, we're going to be ambitious and try for 100 globally. And the first one in the US are also getting started. So it's a growing movement. And we also, um, on top of the event, now try to find other opportunities to promote our, our mission of fostering a responsible and human-centric uh, Internet of Things through advocacy, through some publications and uh, all other kind of uh, measures. Was, was that a, the initial goal as well uh, for ThingsCon? No, we had no idea what we would get ourselves into. We were just um, a few people in Berlin saying, hey, there's this new thing, Internet of Things. It's super interesting and we'd like to understand more about it, but we don't find a good place for independents like us to go to. There's big industry events and there's hobbyist events and they all are great. But for the people who work professionally like or mo are moving into this field, we didn't find any place to go to. And so we just set up a conference and it just seemed to resonate really well and we were really overwhelmed with support. Now, on the Internet of Things is, is, is an interesting uh, uh, subject in the sense that it is quite hard to find a one definition that says it all. What, what is your definition of the Internet of Things? So Internet of Things, or IoT for short, is a, a term that is so vague and wide and all-encompassing that it's probably its own biggest enemy, I would say, because it involves anything from um, tinkering toys where, or educational toys like um, the Arduino, that's a little programmable computer that makes you, you know, get some lights to blink, all the way to big uh, industrial and global supply chain management tools and sensors on cargo containers and um, uh, pacemakers and like and it's the whole spectrum everything like i think it's like easier to take a step back and just say anything physical that's connected to the internet is a good starting point even though it, even there, there are exceptions to what would technically fit into the internet of things because it might not connect to the internet it might just connect to another computer next door um, but like i would say where the physical thing collects and processes data and sends it somewhere okay it's more hands-on there's one, uh, one definition, so um, uh, if you look at, at the Internet of Things uh, today, where, where are we at? What is, what is the state of Internet of Things? Right, so it's at the same time, it's a, it's a very mature system, but at the same time, it's also still the early days. I think we have like a very professional industry that builds IoT products and services, but at the same time, except for the industrial space, I think it's a lot of machinery aimed at nothing specific yet. We need to still figure out what we want to put all this to use for. And if you look at especially a more responsible and more human-centric IoT, which is what interests me most, like a, an ethical good thing that like cares about humans first, um, I think we're in the very early days. Right now it's a lot is driven by engineering and a lot of like, um, oh, well, here, what, what happens if you put a chip on this and connectivity in this? Like, will this chair be better if it tweets? Maybe, maybe not, let's try it out, right? And so we see a lot of experimentation that is very exciting. Um, but as is the case with all these kind of evolutionary approaches where you try all mutations until you figure out what works, there's also a lot of really weird stuff out there. So what, would, uh, what, would the, the, what is the next step that we need to, to, to bring IoT to a more mature phase? Right. So, so I think we need to um, apply basically very basic design standards that currently aren't observed there, which is to put humans first, to do user research, to talk to actual people, look what problems they have and see if we can help them solve them or be more of themselves, have more time to, to fulfill their own potential rather than trying to optimize something that needs an optimization. There's, um, I'm only going to mention like one bad example um, because I just brought it up in my uh, in talk earlier today. And that is, um, there's a connected wine bottle that lets you uh, order more wine online. It also shows you the wine label on its display. But you can only order wine from selected vineyards, and you need a proprietary bottle to put into that extra bottle, and it's really expensive. And so, it's as far as I can tell, it's worse in every respect than a wine bottle used to be. And it's more expensive, and it needs a battery. Like, there's nothing better about it. It doesn't solve any problems. It just is a solution in search of a problem. Um, so I think if we, if we focus on problems and how to solve them and follow a few ground rules like 
trying to build stuff that empowers people, that is respectful, that is inclusive, then I think we're on the right track and we'll find really good use cases. Well, you mentioned a bad example, and I mentioned a few good examples maybe? Sure, there, there's, there's a lot of really um, good examples. Um, like there, there's a really lovely toy design company in Berlin, for example, called Vaikai, and they make lovely wooden toys that allow kids to play together remotely and to send signals to their parents and back. It's very respectful, it's, it's, you don't need to relearn any new behavior, it just enhances a profoundly human experience, which is to play with another and with, with your kids. Uh, really lovely. Um, there's a, a Swiss and French um, uh, research team um, of neuroscientists that recently uh, managed to get a paralyzed monkey to walk again by implanting a brain sensor that would capture the monkey's uh, neurological impulses to walk and transmit it to the part of the spine that was functional again and without having to relearn anything that monkey could just walk again like no training necessary whatsoever um, so this is when connectivity enters the medical field there's lots of questions there, huge responsibility, but also huge chances to really kind of help people um, solve real problems, in this case, to make people work again, uh, walk again in like a few years' time, which I find amazing. Um, and there's many of these examples from like very small to very large and ambitious problems that, that are really, really good. Or another really small example, there's a, a medical tablet that you use to have remote diagnostics, remote teleconferences with your doctor if you live in a rural part of the world without access to doctors. And so you could share these and you can have a private uh, video conferencing or co and consulting session with your doctor. And what I found really interesting when I saw this the first time, it has a camera of course, but because it's all about like medical data and that might be very personal, the, the video camera can be just hidden with a little plastic slider. You can just like slide it close so you know it's not spying on you. It's a very small detail, but I think it's a very profoundly useful thing because you know you're going to have privacy if there's a plastic thing in front of the camera. You already mentioned that you, you, you find it important, uh, or, and especially as, as uh, things go on, grew to, to have a more uh, human-centric mm -hmm. and, and an ethical, uh, uh, well, create an ethical uh, industry. Mm -hmm. how, how do you do that? How do you create uh, these, these ethics? Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of it is really common sense. A lot is just um, not trying to take a shortcut um, in order to save costs. Um, so just to give an example, like a lot of times in both, like uh, basically all over the West, in Europe and the US, um, we build Internet of Things services that are focusing on the service level, not on the hardware, but on the software on top of these things, the services you built around these. And these are driven by data. And so oftentimes you'll find companies that say, well, we don't necessarily need all that data now, but it might be useful in the future to unlock value. And so they just start collecting more data that they not, don't necessarily need. And that's a really unhealthy behavior. So if there's someone in the room who says, actually, we should not store data that we don't absolutely need because it can be abused or be hacked um, in all kinds of ways, um, by criminals, by governments, it can be abused commercially, there's all kinds of problems once you have user data. Um, let's just not save it until we really, really need it. And just like having good data practices is one thing, and having someone in the room who addresses these, then oftentimes it's not like these companies go like, oh yeah, we need to collect a lot of data just because of the app. Like, if there's one person who addresses this issue, oftentimes the problem just goes away. Because they're like, oh yeah, we never consider that, okay, let's just not do it. And that's, that's how this works all the time in these in, in, in meetings um, because it's like three, four people at the desk and they're like, eh, how should we do it? Like, should we have this form field? Should we not have it? Let's drop it. Okay, no problem. Um, and on a hardware level, I think um, we, we don't necessarily have the same issues per se because, um, um, for example, we just went to China to see where all the electronics are made. 90% of electronics worldwide come from Shenzhen, this area just outside of Hong Kong. Um, it's where all the electronics are made. It's the biggest ecosystem that builds this hardware. And there the companies say, we don't know what to do with data. We just want to move hardware pieces. We just want to sell hardware. So why 
so, so startups in the West could probably focus a lot less time on building that hardware themselves and just buy it from there and then make sure that they focus all their energy on building more respectful services on top of that. As long as there are no uh, back doors in the hardware or anything. Sure, which is an issue all over the world. Um, just, just an example, in the 90s, the US government tried to also have backdoors in all smartphones and the uh, industry at that time, for cost reasons, rebelled against it. Um, so that's the thing that all, like in these days, like all governments could potentially try to introduce. Um, I mean, that, and then it's up to like the startups to make sure that the hardware is clean, of course. How do you use the organization of things? Well, is it an organization that you use to, to perceive these goals, or, or do you do it on, on, a, on a personal level, or how does it work? It's um, there is no formal organization uh, these days. It's um, it's really just a group of people. Um, we're going to set up like a, a nonprofit um, in the next couple of weeks to formalize it a little bit. But mostly, it's really personal conversations. There's a, an online back channel. There's a um, intense conversation on Twitter, like open and public as well. Um, and it's really just a bunch of people who kind of work by aligned values and try to um, help each other, like share ideas, share insights. And I believe that over time, if you just in the day to day make really smart decisions and make tiny better decisions every time and better informed decisions, then over time this really adds up to like a large change. And if thousands of people do that, then of course it's going to be even bigger. And if, especially if you look at um, at these big global IoT services, there's a lot of designers here that work with really large companies. A lot of the people in this community work with like you know, the Googles, the Apples, the Samsungs. Um, if even like a tiny decision is made a little bit better, that will roll out to hundreds of millions of people, which is uh, to me pretty mind blowing. That over time this really adds up to something. As, uh, there's other topics that have been uh, uh, talked about uh, uh, in relation to uh, IoT and, and two things that I, I hear a lot is, is, is conversational interfaces yeah. and, uh, uh, and AI. Yeah. Uh, so, so what should we think of those? Sure. Um, conversational interfaces and artificial intelligence are both really the hot buzzword, buzzwords of, of the day. Um, they're also like fairly closely related. So conversational interfaces is the idea that Right now, we still use a lot of screens to have any kind of like interface. So we spend a lot of time looking at apps, and there's a different app for like every application. Like light bulbs have their own apps now, which seems not super useful to me, off the top of my head. Um, so conversational interfaces might be a way around that, because you can chat with them either on the screen or by a voice, and you just have a more human seeming conversation that's more accessible you don't need to learn um, a new interface every time you can just like talk to stuff and there's like some tremendous um, startups that for example take all the things from all your smart home appliances all your smart locks and your smart light bulbs and all the all the things we see offered for the smart home and you can just chat with it in one interface you say hey um, I'm having a guest over her name is blah 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 um, please unlock the door for her um, and it'll just make that happen for you, which is, is really helpful. Um, and it's, it's much easier and you don't need to learn the machine, the machine learns you, which is nice. And artificial intelligence takes this, it's, it's the technology that enables all of this, but it also takes it to a next level where um, machine learning and AI um, help train software to recognize patterns and help anticipate stuff that you might that might be interesting for you or helpful for you. So for example, um, a, a good application of this is when you now talk to Siri or like any other voice assistant. This, is, uh, this only works because it has listened to hundreds of millions of people's voices and identified and learned how to and actually understand accents and dialects. Like I speak with a German accent, so my English oftentimes would totally throw off these voice recognition systems even a couple of years ago. Now that's a lot less of a problem. And we see this all over the place. And so AI and machine learning, which are kind of like kind of the same thing, um, is something that we see all over the place in search results and empowered through machine learning, um, not through people, uh, voice recognition, chat interfaces, all these things. Like Google now considers itself primarily a machine learning company, not a search company. 
Okay, that's very exciting. Uh, um, and, and we see things like Alexa coming up and uh, all these other devices. You've got Viv Labs, interesting company, obviously, for, uh, for, for the voice processing and everything bought by, by Samsung. Um, from a personal level, what, what is? Uh, are you working on a project in the IoT field? Is, is there anything that you would like to contribute to? Um, sure. So, I mean, there's, there's, there's several things. I'm not launching any product myself. Um, I have neither the skills nor the ambition to do that as far as of now. Um, there's, um, I do uh, client work in that field, so I work a lot with big tech companies around the policy implications of technology, around uh, strategy and research projects, and, and to just like help you know automotive companies and tech companies figure out what's next. So that's kind of my my day job, if you will. Um, and also, I would like to um, push ThingsCon to the next level. Um, by engaging more in advocacy for this responsible Internet of Things beyond just having events. Like, the events are a great meeting place and it's where all the conversation and reflection happens, but I'd also like it to the next level to more actively promote these things with policymakers, with consumer rights organizations, um, because all these groups um, know that there's something important happening, but they, like everybody else, they have trouble navigating all the like thorny issues in this field because it's it's really, all of these are like they're very complex, they're highly technical, and they all involve a lot of data, and we're really bad at abstracting what data might do if we collect it over time, and what, what could be done with that 10 years from now. When we have much more powerful artificial intelligence, when we have much more powerful data mining tools, and that's something that I think I'd like to spend a lot more time on for the next couple of years to help raise awareness in policy levels and consumer rights groups on, on how to how to really represent consumer rights in that field. Does that resonate a little bit? Is, is there enough uh, interest from governments and, uh, or the European Union, for instance, in this, in this field? The, um, all, the, all the big government organizations and consumer rights organizations, they're all really looking into this. And it depends on where you look. Like in Europe, um, and especially in Germany, for example, Internet of Things is either seen through the lens of uh, innovation and competitiveness, like as an as a economic driving factor, or as a consumer rights issue. Um, but also they're like having a hard time wrapping their head around the implications sometimes. Um, in the US, it's much more driven through a, um, a startup and, and a job creation um, aspect. Uh, in, in China, it is mostly a driver to, to sell more hardware. And so it depends, really depends on where you look, where in the world you look. And so the, the demand is definitely there, um, but it's not always easy to find the right people to talk to, uh, and it goes both ways, like I know policymakers really, really love to learn more about this, but often don't find trusted sources on the ground, and so we, we try to like do a little matchmaking there, uh, but it's very early days, like we're still trying to figure out how to best do that. Would, would there be, uh, could there be some sort of a uh, um, set of rules that, uh, for instance, the European Union could implement and to create a great area where we could create uh, beautiful things, uh, uh, user-centric, ethical uh, IoT solutions? I'd love to say yes, uh, and I'm going to say yes, but I don't know those rules yet. I don't think like I should just pull them out of out of my nose. Um, but that's something that actually might be a good idea to to take this community and start like a public call and figure out together what these rules should look like, and then just like propose them to the European Commission. Um, because I know that they're, they're actually this kind of input would be actionable enough for them to actually work with it. Rather than just like a lot of people like raising their fingers and saying it needs to be better, which is what I've been doing like throughout this whole interview. <laughs> That's very important. <laughs> very important as well. So uh, thank you yeah. for talking to us and, uh, and wish you a great day here at ThingsCon uh, Amsterdam and uh, and all the other ThingsCon uh, coming up in uh, in other parts of the world. Thank, thank you so much for having me.